us on Praise the Lord from Honolulu, Hawaii, as we bring you anointed pastors, evangelists, teachers, authors, and other special guests with testimonies and teaching to encourage and inspire and music to glorify God as we lift up Jesus Christ as Lord. to praise the Lord and we know that today you will have a blessing as God speaks to our hearts as we talk about God and the nation and we have a wonderful lineup of people we'll be interviewing but before we, we begin that we want to encourage you uh, to subscribe to our newsletter and if you're not subscribed to the newsletter this this will be a blessing to you you can do that either by dialing 1-888 731-1000, that's 1-888-731-1000, or you can visit www.tbn.org for, your, for your, your newsletter and uh, join with us as we share the information together. But let's, let's move forward. We're privileged to have Dr. Kirby Anderson. Thank you so much for joining with us. Jonathan, good to be with you today. Thank you for coming. Kirby Anderson has, uh, is host of a national radio talk show. I believe you're on over 400 stations, and he appears regularly on Primetime America, on Open Line. You have lots of accolades, a master's from Yale in science, and a master's from Georgetown in government, president of Probe Ministries. You've written all kinds of books, some of them signs of warning, signs of hope, moral dilemmas, Christian ethics in plain language, a biblical point of view on Islam, Biblical point of view on homosexuality, biblical point of view on lots of things, <laughs> intelligent design, spiritual warfare, making the most of your money. You, you sound like you're a guy that has your, your ear close to the ground and, and your feet in touch with what's happening uh, for normal people in our country. So really appreciate you sharing with us to well, help, yeah. help us grapple with God and politics, God in the nation. We're seeing so much that is, is changing. Can you help set the stage for us? Well, I think we have to recognize that right now we're in a time of transition, and there's a, certainly a need for us to, as Christians, think biblically about various areas of life. And one of those we're going to talk about today is history and government. Uh, those are areas that sometimes we haven't had very good education on. The churches sometimes have not done a good job of educating us on that. Uh, if you look at the textbooks, they have been, in many cases, stripped of some of the religious heritage of our nation. And so, if anything, over the next couple of minutes, we want to try to see if we can rectify some of that. So how did Christianity play a key role in the foundation of our nation? Well, maybe let's divide it in two areas. First of all, the founding of America and then the framing of our government. But in the founding, I can use a couple of examples. Um, we can go back 400 years and you can talk about the, the Puritans. And when they landed here, they did not have a charter for where they landed. So before they disembarked, they actually drafted up what was called the Mayflower Compact. Now, when I was at Georgetown, my professor, who probably could not sign the doctrinal statement of your church, nevertheless had to say this really was the first constitution in America. And really, you had written down the idea that we are going to have a covenant with one another before God. Uh, you can move from the pilgrims maybe to the Puritans. And the Puritans had what was known as a Puritan covenant, where they actually wrote down what those rules and those regulations and those rights were. And the problem up until that time is an English law, it was primarily an oral tradition. Mm -hmm. And Jonathan, you probably had situations where maybe somebody said, I promised, and later on they said, no, I didn't promise. And if you didn't write it down, sometimes you, they'd say, well, no, that's just your recollection of that. Mm -hmm. But they actually wrote down, uh, this is hundreds of years, about 150 years, if you will, before the uh, Constitution 
various rules and regulations that were very important. And then you can go to some of the other various places, whether it's Roger Williams or maybe it's the Quakers, for example. Um, and you have all sorts of attempts to protect dissidents and all sorts of kind of religious ideas that were founding the nation. And then that led up to what eventually was known as the First Great Awakening. Mm -hmm. And the First Great Awakening in large part precedes the Amer American Revolution because uh, whether it was Jonathan Edwards or George Whitfield, each one of those individuals were really speaking to those ideas. And really during the revolution, there were pastors who uh, the British used to call the Black Regiment because they wore black robes. Mm -hmm. And they were seen as most dangerous because many of those individuals that fought either in the regular army or in the militia were motivated in large part by some of the sermons that were given in the churches. So when you talk just about the founding of our country, you can recognize that uh, Christian values were very important in the founding of America. So it, it seems like there's a close integration of faith, of biblical understanding of God mm -hmm. that was there in the minds and in the practical working of government. Certainly. Is that an accurate statement? I think so. And when you go back and look at uh, many of the sermons of that day, because we'll move from maybe the founding of the country to the framing of the Constitution. When I was at Georgetown University, one of my professors, interestingly enough, was working with other professors at places like University of Houston and LSU. And they went back and looked at all of the documents during the founding era. Mm -hmm. Instead of listening to what a professor today would say, they said, so let's go look at what uh, Madison, Hamilton, Jay, Jefferson, Benjamin Franklin, all of them were saying. And as they looked at all of the various things that they said, wrote about, letters back and forth, various documents, they concluded that there was one source that surfaced time and time again that was the primary source for those ideas, and it was the Bible. Mm -hmm. But then when they looked back, they recognized that about three-fourths of the quotes that they used actually were from sermons of that day. Mm -hmm. In other words, the pastors in those churches back when the Revolutionary War began and then afterwards when they were under the Articles of Confederation, they were the ones addressing those issues. So the ideas from the pulpits of America ended up becoming part of our United States Constitution. So you can see whether it's in the founding of America or the framing of our government, religious ideas and in particular Christian ideas were very, very important. So fast forward us. I mean, I, I pray, I open, I pray in the opening of city council and legislature, that kind of thing. And before you do that, the lawyers come in front of you and say, you can't say this, you can't use God's name, you can't, all that kind of dynamic. Now, how did we get from there to where we are now? How, help, help bring that together for those of us that are just just normal jokes. Sure. Well, I see two trends. Number one, there was a cultural trend that began to say, let's pay less attention to religious ideas. And by the time you get to the turn of the 20th century, there were people writing the textbooks of that day who were deliberately trying to remove religious ideas. Now, they weren't necessarily always against religion, but they were convinced that the best way to understand history is to look at economic ideas. Mm -hmm. And at that time, the idea of Marxism and Hegel and others were very important. So they began to say, we can explain everything in terms of what happens in history in terms of economics. And if you were to go outside of the studio and ask somebody what led to the American Revolution, if you got a good answer at all, you probably wouldn't get very good ones, but if you got at least one good answer, it'd probably be something like taxation without representation. In other words, it was economic. If you look at the Declaration of Independence, there are 28 different grievances that they listed. That's just one, not even perhaps the most significant one. So they strip those ideas away. Well, at the same time, in the law schools, you know, you had uh, Christopher Columbus Langdell, who was the head of the Harvard Law School, and others they are beginning to strip religious ideas out. And by the time you get to 1947, there's a very famous case, Justice Hugo Black, that took a phrase by Thomas Jefferson and turned it on its head. And I know your next speaker is going to get into that in more detail and use that to basically say there should be a wall of separation between church and state. So in the textbooks and in the legal presentation, we remove these ideas of religious uh, ideas from the public arena. Give me some hope. <laughs> <laughs> um, I mean, o Obama just, President Obama just gave the State of the Union address mm -hmm. and he said, I think we've just turned a page. Um, whether that's true or not, where do you see the U.S. today? And um, what's the health of our nation? Yeah. 
Well, and I think uh, the president obviously has to be very positive in the State of the Union address. You know, every president stands before the American people, at least ever since we've begun to televise those, since uh, first Woodrow Wilson began to give those speeches and then it began to be televised uh, later on under uh, other presidents like uh, Harry Truman following. They all say that the State of the Union is fine, the State of the Union is good, uh, the State of the Union is strong, whatever phrase they might use. I think anybody, though, that looks at the economic issues got to, has to be concerned somewhat. Eighteen trillion dollars in debt, that's a source of some concern, and certainly the breakdown of the family, that's got to be a big concern. Uh, but I also believe that uh, sometimes the greatest uh, revivals and reformations that have taken place usually take place with a small group of individuals. And I would have to say that people listening to this program right now, if they wanted to really begin to study our history and really wanted to be the salt of the earth and the light of the world, they'll make a difference. And we have found that it really there is a tremendous amount of spiritual renewal and revival that's taking place in America. So I haven't necessarily uh, tried on one hand to always be negative or always be positive. You mentioned one of my books, Signs of Warning, Signs mm -hmm. of Hope. Mm -hmm. I can give you a very long list of very strong concerns that we should have about this nation and uh, the expansion of government and the indebtedness that we have. Mm -hmm. But on the other hand, I would have to say that if you look at the youngest generation, I mean, this is the millennial generation that's given you see you at the pole and true love waits and been involved in short-term missions. Uh, we're right now using Christian media to educate individuals literally around the world. Mm -hmm. uh, so there are reasons to be hopeful, but the key to that is whether or not the individual Christians and the churches of America want to make a difference and really be the salt of the earth and the light of the world. So what role as Christian citizens uh, can we play in our country? Uh, many of us feel just discouraged. Seems like the harder we try, it's just wasted yeah. time, wasted voice, wasted energy. Um, how, do we, uh, how do we do that practically? Sure. Well, the Bible tells us a few things. First of all, we are to obey those in authority, Romans 13, verses mm -hmm. 1 to 7. And so that means that we are to be good citizens. We are to obey those in authority. That doesn't mean we obey individuals that exercise their rule and authority over us in an inappropriate way. There are times for maybe civil disobedience, but those are very rare. But we have examples like that. Acts 5.29 says we obey God rather than mm -hmm. men. Mm -hmm. So the first thing is Christians should be the best citizens. We should obey those in authority. Number two, we should pray for those in authority. Uh, First Peter 2, when the Apostle Paul is writing to Timothy, says you need to pray for those in authority. And whether you elected this president or not, whether you elected your two United States senators or not, whether you elected uh, and voted for your representative, we should pray for those in authority. And those would be people like the president, the nine members of the Supreme Court, your governor, your two senators, your representative certainly would fit to that category. You could add to that your state representative and your state senator. There's that key 16 people that you should pray for. And then finally, I think we should also vote for those in authority. And I can't show you a particular verse, but the implication in Romans 13 is those who are given power mm -hmm. are those individuals that have to ultimately answer before God on how they use that power. Well, when Paul wrote that, who was in power? Well, the Caesars, maybe the Roman Senate occasionally. Who's in power now? We are. I mean, in the last election, we were able to elect 435 members to the House of Representatives, mm -hmm. 36 United States Senators. The next couple of elections, you will elect again a president and over a six-year period, elect 100 different uh, United States Senators. When you add up all the governor's races, state representative races, some people have figured there may be 30,000 different elections that take place in America over that period of time, mm -hmm. from president all the way down to dog catcher. It seems to me that we should vote intelligently. And then, of course, I think we have a responsibility to be in the community. You know, you just don't vote every two years. Mm -hmm. After you vote, I think you have responsibility to let your elected representatives know how you feel about those issues. And quite frankly, Jonathan, I'd have to say that some of the biggest challenges America faces are not going to be solved in Albany, New York, or Washington, D.C., <laughs> or Tallahassee, Florida, or Honolulu, Hawaii. <laughs> They're going to be solved in the homes and in the churches. And then we really need to be uh, mm -hmm. speaking to the culture, a living biblical lifestyles before the watching world, and recognizing that God can bless those kinds of individuals and the kinds of actions that we take. 
Are, are we putting too much emphasis on the importance of government and changing our our culture and changing our nation? Yeah. I mean, how much of it is grassroots? And and, and I, I, you know, talk to pastors, and some pastors just say, "Oh, I'm just going to deal with the gospel." Yeah. You know, I just speak to that. There's a balance between the two because you've seen some people have gotten so politically involved, they think we can bring about the second great awakening, the third great awakening. And I remember one person during the 1980s said, you know, with politics, we can bring in, um, we can usher in the kingdom of God. And I thought, well, that's heresy, you know. So we certainly want to reject that idea that politics is the be all and end all. But I would say to pastors who say, I'm just going to preach the gospel, if you don't pay attention to some of the things happening in your community, your freedom to preach the gospel is going to be affected. Uh, I'm not just talking about these big church state issues because there are some of those. Some of the biggest issues I think we're going to face in the 21st century are things like zoning laws, whether or not your church can have a Christian school, whether or not they're going to allow you to even have a church in this locale based on parking and all sorts of things. Uh, so I think it is really important to recognize that uh, pastors certainly don't want to turn their church into a political action committee. But on the other hand, I think if you are going to be a good citizen educating members of your congregation, speaking to the moral issues of the day, as did those pastors back in the 16th and 17th century mm -hmm. did, and even up to the 18th century, because you can talk about the first great awakening, the second great awakening, we certainly need to address those social issues, and those social issues oftentimes have a political implication as well. As we wrap up our, our time here, I, I'd like you to pray for us. Because so many just average families, it just seems so big and so hopeless. And, and we, we vote and we don't seem to get, it seems to get worse and not better, that kind of dynamic. And would you just pray, and I'm, and I'm sure that we have people that, that are listening that, that are struggling with uh, their own involvement in the community and they've got all kinds of pressures on us. And so would you lead us in, in a, a word of prayer and then we, we will, um, people may want to call the prayer line afterward and, and pray with other people that are available. Very good. Please Let's do pray. Yeah. Father, we do thank you for the opportunity to um, be involved and you have called on us to be the salt of the earth and the light of the world. And so we do pray right now that each one of us might in the quietness of our heart might consider what you might have for us. There are different gifts and different callings, and we pray that you might uh, guide each one of us to know how we can use those gifts that you have given to us and that calling that we might be able to seek that diligently, that we might make a difference. And I pray, Father, for a spirit of encouragement at a time when so many are discouraged, and I pray that your actions in our lives might give us new and renewed hope and vigor and desire to make a difference. And each generation has had to deal with the challenges and you have placed us into this time. You have raised us up for a time such as this that we might make a difference. So Father, I pray right now for each one watching this program that you might guide them and direct them, that we might be found faithful and that we might be an instrument of your peace and an opportunity that you might give to us to share the gospel and to stand for righteousness and make a difference in our community. And Father, we thank this uh, for the blessing that you are giving to us, and we pray this in your name. Amen. Amen. Kirby Anderson, thank you so much. I wish we had a day to mm -hmm. sit and talk, and we want to encourage those of you watching at home to call in on the prayer line and uh, at any point, if, if there are people waiting to pray for you. And uh, Kirby, we will be praying for you. Thank you. Thank you for your role and your leadership and a voice in our nation in, in such powerful ways. We have a song now, Windows of Hope and Holy and Anointed, and we praise God that we can continue the, the, this discussion in a few minutes. Thank you.
Welcome back to Praise the Lord, and we continue our discussion on God and the nation. Privilege to have Dr. Richard Land with us. Uh, thank you so much for joining us, Dr. Land. My pleasure. Dr. Land is an expert in church and state relations. Um, he was 2005 Time Magazine's featured as one of the 25 most influential evangelicals in America. You have had national radio talk shows. You've, uh, you are presently the president of Southern Evangelical Seminary, which is the non-denominational seminary in Charlotte. Um, you've served as a governor's senior advisor in church state issues, areas relating to family values. You've served five terms with the U.S. Commission on International Religious Freedom, appointed by uh, former President Bush and later Senate Majority Leader Bill Frist. And, later Senator Mitch McConnell. You've served 25 years as president of the Ethics and Religious Liberty Commission of the Southern Baptist Convention, degrees from Princeton, uh, Master of Theology from New Orleans Baptist Theological Seminary, Doctor of Philosophy from Oxford, and all kinds of books. Your latest is The Divided States of America. I could be here all day just oh. talking about you, but just really appreciate I, I, that you're willing to take from this vast experience not only in politics in our nation and with state church relations, but help sift this down for us. Well, it's my calling. Uh, when God called me to preach when I was 16 years old, you know, I, I grew up in Southern Baptist life and, and foreign missionaries were the rock stars. When the foreign missionaries came, yeah. it, was, it was the big deal. But God called me, the, the burden that God laid on my heart was America. And, and calling America back to God. And um, we need missionaries, and I consider myself a missionary to America. Amen, that's wonderful. Can you, can you help us with this fundamental understanding of separation of church mm -hmm. and state? It's used all kinds of ways. Well, it's been weaponized to be used by progressives and secularists and liberals to try to say that if, we believe, if, if our views, if our opinions, if our values come from scripture or come from religion, that we're somehow disqualified from the public policy debate. And that's utter nonsense. And in fact, it's forbidden by the Constitution. The and Constitution. Why is it? Well, because there's a tremendous, been a tremendous effort for most of this, uh, for most of the last century and the first part of this century to turn the First Amendment on its head mm -hmm. and to try to weaponize it to censor Christians and to censor people of faith. But if we go back to the beginning, the, the um, First Amendment says that Congress shall make no law affecting an establishment of religion, nor interfering with the free exercise thereof. Well, when you stop and think about that, only the government can violate the First Amendment. You and I cannot violate the First Amendment. We can't set up an establishment of religion, and we can't interfere with the free exercise of religion. Uh, we're the ones that are protected by the First Amendment. What we have in the First Amendment, and what it was intended to do, was to make freedom for religion, not freedom from religion. And that's, the, that's what they've tried to turn on his head. And they've used an obscure phrase from a letter that Thomas Jefferson wrote 
uh, in 1802, uh, January 1st, 1802, to the Baptist ministers of Danbury, Connecticut, mm -hmm. in which he said that there ought to be a wall of separation between the church and the state. Well, now let me give you the background of that letter. First of all, it was written to the Baptist ministers of Danbury, Connecticut. Nine of the original 13 states had tax-supported state churches that discriminated to varying degrees against people who weren't part of that church. In New England, they were congregational. In the South, they were Episcopalian. In the, in the middle states, they were, uh, they were Presbyterian. Now, the Baptists were having to pay taxes to the state church, either, even though they weren't part of it. They were discriminated against by the state church. So they wrote to the new president, Thomas Jefferson, asking for relief from this. The letter that he sent to them went through three drafts, was circulated to his cabinet, and he very consciously said there ought to be a wall of separation between the church and the state, not between public policy and faith. Now, secondly, if you understand the background, you understand that it could never mean what, what the ACLU and others have tried to make it mean, which is that, that, that somehow that we're disqualified from bringing our faith convictions to bear on public policy issues. On the, fr on the Friday, when Thomas Jefferson wrote the last draft of that letter, at about half past 10 in the morning, a Baptist evangelist named John Leland showed up at the, at the White House by prearrangement with a, an 1,100-pound cheese that they had made as a gift to Jefferson uh, for their appreciation for him. John Leland um, told the president how much they loved him, how he was a gift to America. He presented the cheese. He promised the president that no Federalist cows had contributed any milk to the cheese, only Democrat <laughs> cows. And uh, then he left. And then Jefferson went back into the White House. He had lunch. We do not know whether he had any of the cheese. That afternoon, he wrote the last draft of the letter, mailed it off. That next Sunday morning, the very next Sunday morning, he went to a worship service in the House of Representatives where, a, where John Leland preached a sermon from the speaker's rostrum of the House of Representatives with Thomas Jefferson sitting on the front row, they had regular worship services in the House of Representatives with different preachers preaching from the speaker's rostrum until 1850. Clearly, Jefferson did not mean by that letter what the ACLU wants us to think he meant by that letter. We have, we have freedom for religion, not freedom from religion, and the government to put it, I'll put it this way, government is not supposed to be a coach for religion, a sponsor for religion, a cheerleader for religion, or a censor or suppressor of religion. The government is supposed to be an umpire. It just makes sure that everybody plays fair. People say times change, values change, the way we operate changes <coughs> now. Can you help us understand this uh, <coughs> distinction between religious freedom mm -hmm. and the exercise mm -hmm. of it and discrimination? that everyone seemed to say, sure. well, which is now the big clash. Well, first of all, when, when the country, when the First Amendment was written, 97% um, of the country was Protestant. Uh, clearly that's changed. We have had, had Catholic immigration and we've had <coughs> the rise of secularism and other isms. But what we believe in in this country and what we are set up for with our First Amendment is pluralism, not secularism. Mm -hmm. And that means that people are free to worship as they please or not to worship without any penalties, without any discrimination. I don't want the government punishing people for what they believe or what they don't believe. Um, what the government should do is maximally accommodate your right, my right, everyone's right to come into the public square and to say, well, I think this is wrong and it's wrong based upon my beliefs and my values. And my values and my beliefs do not disqualify me from having an opinion about what should be done. Mm -hmm. You know, if we were to follow the progressives to the letter, uh, Dr. King would never have been able to do what he did. Dr. King was a Baptist preacher, mm -hmm. pastor of a Baptist church. Mm -hmm. and, and when he said that this is wrong, and it must change. And he protested against unjust laws. And he said they were unjust laws because they didn't coincide with the moral law of God. I would encourage everyone who's listening to this program to go online and to get the letter from the Birmingham jail and read it. It is a remarkable piece of American history. And in it, Dr. King from the Birmingham jail, writing his letter on discarded newspaper, 
writes about why he's in the jail. He said, I'm in this jail because I refuse to obey an unjust law, and it's an unjust law based upon the moral law of God. And he said, I long for the day when Christians, back in the first few centuries of the Christian faith, when Christians were thermostats, determining the moral temperature of a society, not merely thermometers reflecting and recording the moral temperature of society. And that's what Jesus meant when he said that we're to be the salt of the earth and the light of the world. Uh, there's no room in being the salt of the earth and the light of the world for Christians to withdraw from society and not be concerned. Every major social issue in American life that has been rectified that was wrong has been done so by people that were led by their faith. The abolitionist movement was led by evangelicals and other people of faith. The labor reform movement, the child labor reform movement, all of these movements were led by people of faith. The integration civil rights movement. So speak, speak to the teacher in the classroom, the military chaplain who said, you can't pray in the name of Jesus. Mm -hmm. Or the teacher, you can't mention God or, or, or Christmas or anything like that. We, we, we've come so far that it, it appears that Christians are, are you know, hiding mm -hmm. behind a wall and I, we're afraid to say anything. Speak to that, that person very practically. Well, those are, those are different scenarios. It'll yes. take me a little bit of time to talk about that. First of all, in the, in the chaplaincy, um, we, we've said if you're going to serve our country, we want you to, um, we want to accommodate your having people, uh, faith leaders of your choice that can be there to minister to you. So we have the government pays for the chaplaincy, but it doesn't require chaplains to be any particular faith. They're all different kinds of faith. Mm -hmm. if, if you have people that are serving in the military, <clears throat> then you have the right to have chaplains. And, um, um, and, and the, the government shouldn't try to restrict or to monitor what those chaplains do. If you have a Baptist chaplain, he ought to be able to pray the way Baptists pray. If you have a Catholic mm -hmm. priest as a chaplain, mm -hmm. he ought to be able to pray a Catholic way a Catholic priest prays. If you have a Muslim chaplain, mm -hmm. then he ought to be able to pray the way a Muslim prays. This is this is religious freedom. Okay. Not not some sort of restricted, dumbed down, you know, Obi-Wan Kenobi, may the right. force be with you. Now when it comes to schools, when it comes to public schools, you're in a very special situation. Because you're dealing with minors who are there without their guardians and without their parents. Mm -hmm. And um, I had, for instance, I got into some trouble uh, a few years ago because um, there was a woman, a teacher in a New York City school and a little boy in her class, his mother died. And so the other children in the class wanted to know what happened, wh where did Johnny's mother go? Well, this lady gave a very orthodox, traditional Catholic interpretation of where her mother, where Johnny's mother was. And she was reprimanded. She was. Uh, laid off for a week without pay. And I was asked about this and I said, well, I don't think I would have laid her off without pay, but she shouldn't have done what she did because she violated the constitutional rights of all the parents who weren't Catholic. And I said, let's, let's put, it, put the shoe on the other foot. What if she'd been a Satanist? Mm -hmm. and she gave a Satanist interpretation? Mm -hmm. Or what if she'd been an atheist and she'd given an atheist answer? What she should have said was, uh, that's a question you need to ask your mom and your dad. And when you go home, you need to ask your mom and your dad that question. Um, I also think that there are some legitimate restrictions that need to be on teachers, not on students, mm -hmm. on teachers when they're on, in public schools because the teacher is the authority figure. The teacher is the symbol of the state. And I had three children and, you know, if, if they think the teacher said that two plus two is five, try to convince them that two plus two is four. I mean, mm -hmm. it, well, the teacher said. Mm -hmm. And so uh, if you want your teachers to be people who are going to be espousing your faith, mm -hmm. then you need to send them to Christian schools, uh, which is where my children went. My children all went to Christian schools, K through 12, because I wanted them to have the authority figure who was the teacher reinforcing what we were teaching at home. But in the public schools, uh, I think we have to be careful prior to college. Now, once you get into college, it's different because you're dealing with adults. You're dealing mm -hmm. with people who are over 18 years of age. I also think that um, uh, the government should not try to make the public school a religion-free zone. Mm -hmm. When students walk on to public school property, they don't leave their First Amendment rights behind them. Students should have the right 
to express their faith and to share their faith with each other and to pray as they feel led to pray. I mean, I've had cases where, where students have complained to me that they've laid their head down on their desk and the teacher said, well, if you're resting, you can do that, but if you're praying, you've got to stop. Well, that's idiocy. Mm -hmm. Of course they have the right to pray, as long as it's not disruptive to class. And of course they have the right to share their faith. And if the teacher declares what in legal terms is called a limited open forum, she says, well, today we're gonna to talk about where, where did man come from? Well, once she does that, then she can't, she can't preclude people saying, well, I believe God created man. Mm -hmm. The student has the right to say, well, I believe that the Bible's right when the Bible says that God created man, male and female created thee them. And if she says, well, that's a violation of separation of church and state, she's trampling on his religious rights and she is practicing religious censorship. Wow. So where, how do we move forward so that God can bless America? I, I, I mean, we... Yeah. we well, it, God, it is, God, like has, look, God has told us, God has told us how he'll bless America. Okay. If my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven and forgive their sin and heal their land. Now, here's the unpleasant truth. Whether America has a future worth having doesn't depend on what the lost people do. Mm -hmm. It doesn't depend on what the atheists do. Mm -hmm. It depends on what the Christians do. If my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways. Well, what does it mean to humble ourselves? It means to come to the place where we understand our problems are bigger than we are. We've got God-sized problems that only God can solve. And our answer and our salvation is not coming from Washington, D.C. It's not coming from our state capital. Mm -hmm. Government is a caboose. Yeah. The people are the locomotive. When the people change, the government will change. Mm -hmm. And frankly, uh, if we want to know what's wrong with America, we need to look in the mirror. Uh, it, and, and it all goes back, in my opinion, it goes back to a failure of the pulpit. Mm -hmm. We have not had enough men of God who will stand in the pulpit, the sacred desk, and tell the people the truth, the pure, unvarnished truth of the Word of God, instead of giving them teachings that tickle their ears. You know, God, God loves you the way you are. Well, God loves us the way we are, but He's not going to bless us the way we are unless we're walking in the way that God wants us to walk. That now means we're, we're going to preach against divorce, for instance. We're just, excuse me, we're, we're coming right down to the end. I want to speak in one more question mm -hmm. really quick. What difference does Hawaii make in the national scene? I mean, we, 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 we're so small, we're way out here in the Pacific. Talk to people in Hawaii. Well, practically, um, I think we're evenly divided enough as a nation that um, every vote counts and every state's electoral votes count. I mean, we saw that in 2000. I think we're increasingly in the, in the near future going to see that, um, that our elections are gonna be very close. So every vote counts. Secondly, Hawaii is America's future. But you're, you're, you're the most demographically diverse state in the country. Yep. But the rest of the country is going to catch up. So Hawaii is a sort of a, a, a laboratory for America's future. And I think Hawaii can do a great deal to show America how you can be diverse ethnically, diverse um, economically, diverse religiously, and still um, live together in harmony. That is quite a statement coming from someone like yourself with so much exposure. Would you pray quickly, we have 20 seconds, would you pray for Hawaii, would you pray for our nation? Absolutely, be privileged to. Father, we thank you for this time together and uh, Father, I just pray that you'll continue to bless the, this network as it puts out the truth. We pray for Hawaii, we pray for the United States of America. Yes, Please Lord. God, bless America and make America a nation that you can bless. Yes. Send revival, send awakening, yes. send reformation. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen. Dr. Land, thank you so much. Thank we you. really appreciate you sharing with us. Again, we're privileged now to have a song, Windows of Hope, and stay with us.
back to praise the Lord. If there's anywhere where we need the power and the joy of God is when we talk about politics and God and the nation. And it's a privilege to have with us Representative Sharon Har. Sharon, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, Pastor time. Jonathan. Thank you for having me. Sharon was first elected to office in 2006. You've been re-elected for your fifth term. Congratulations thank and you. the confidence of our constituency in you. She's an attorney of law member of the House Committees on Consumer Protection and Commerce, Labor, Transportation, Public Safety. And you've served in lots of areas in the community. Um, I want to get, get right to it, Sharon. Um, you've been in government now and here in Hawaii for 10 years. Uh, how have you seen things change? What are some of the dynamics that have shifted for you, generally and specifically in terms of God and, and politics? Well, thank you for that question, Pastor Jonathan. I think that, again, in the decade that I've been serving in the House, I've seen dramatic changes. Um, I think, first and foremost, you're starting to see the type of people who are being elected and the type of people who are running for office. Um, I think, you know, uh, generations ago or even, um, you know, years ago, you had uh, specific people running uh, from specific stakeholder groups, running their candidates to serve their special interests. Um, and today, uh, the types of people that we see running for office are uh, very secular in nature. Uh, they do believe in this concept of church and state, which was just previously discussed by Dr. Land. Um, it's a much younger generation of uh, kids, and oftentimes you know, there is, uh, they're called the millennium generation. And I think, uh, again, not to knock anybody in age, but I think it's incumbent upon anybody who runs for office to have some background, whether it be in business or whether it be in you know, whatever uh, facet of their lives, they have to have some specialty in which they uh, focus in on because otherwise they bring nothing to the table with respect to being being a good legislator. Um, you know, many people laugh at me that not only am I a politician, but I'm also an attorney. So people say I should sell used cars while I'm at it. Uh, but that said, I think that being a, an attorney in private sector has really helped shape many of the views that I bring into the legislature, whether it's uh, representing businesses, whether it's representing small businesses, and having that ability to discern between um, 
you know, just being able to pontificate from one point of view without having that knowledge and that work experience and understanding what the average person is going through in terms of trying to make ends meet. So it's a really different type of um, a person who's running for office today. Uh, many of them don't have the background. They're not paying a mortgage. They still live with mom and dad. Uh, many of them uh, have never had a real job outside of the capital. This is their first run. This is their first real uh, uh, employment. And so, uh, again, without having that perspective of representing the everyday person. So, uh, so excuse me, so I, I'm getting a feel that, that you're saying there's a bit of a, of a rift between some of the people that are running and, and the reality of, of what's it like to live here in Hawaii. Absolutely. Now, now you're, you're known as a friend of families and the willingness to speak out on tough issues. You've got a lot of courage inside that skin. And so how, um, can you give us some of the things we're facing what are some of the, I mean, we, we went through last yeah. year with the whole pushing through of, of uh, same-sex marriage stuff, and what, what, what's, what's ahead? Okay. Well, I think really uh, the issue right now is the fact that you have a very vo a small vocal minority who's making the decisions for the silent majority. We witnessed that with the same-sex marriage special session. Um, if you looked at the number of individuals who are in civil unions who would have been at that time impacted by same-sex marriage, we were talking about approximately one-fifth of one percent of Hawaii's population. Yeah. Uh, the new issue right now, the hot topic right now, and in fact there will be a hearing tomorrow at the state capitol. Um, the state now, uh, the legislature is now uh, moving in the direction of legalizing marijuana. And, uh, you know, you're looking at 13, under the guise of medical marijuana, that, you know, some of my colleagues take the position that uh, marijuana is medicinal, is in fact medicine. And so now they want to set up these statewide dispensaries. Uh, if you look at this, I mean, the fact of the matter is this, is that whether it's decriminalization, uh, whether it's medical marijuana dispensaries, what we're talking about is legalization of marijuana. And if you look at the number of medical marijuana patients we have here in the state of Hawaii, that's, we're talking 13,000 registered patients. Out of a population of 1.3 million, I mean, who are we doing this for? Um, and so it's very disheartening to know that my colleagues, uh, again, many of them have not had the practical experience of representing businesses, et cetera. And so I think it's easy to pontificate and think that they're doing well for a certain segment of the population. Okay, so, so why? Is this, is this a, a spiritual battle that's going on, that, that politicians are pawns? I mean, why do, is there so much power and emphasis for such a small percentage of the population, whether it's marijuana or other kinds of issues. Mm -hmm. Well, again, I think most politicians, uh, they have a tendency to listen to registered voters who live in their districts. And uh, for the most part, as you know, uh, in this past election, we saw the lowest voter turnout in Hawaii's history. Uh, unfortunately, again, we have a major problem in this state with people not getting involved. And so when you have the vocal minority who is very loud and who actually votes, my colleagues have a tendency to listen to those individuals. So when you ask me the question, Pastor Jonathan, is a spiritual warfare? I would disagree. I don't think it's spiritual warfare because in order to have spiritual warfare, you have to actually have a group that's engaged you know, within the spirit. And in uh, this case, I see uh, many of the uh, elected officials who are now coming into office don't necessarily believe believe in God and I think that you know that therein lies the problem uh, that many of them believe that again this notion of separation of church and state they bought into uh, this notion they think that uh, they don't understand the First Amendment as was explained by Dr. Land and so uh, because they adhere to this position they feel that whatever the faith-based community is saying is completely off base and that the vocal, vocal minority is actually in the majority. Do you get discouraged? Absolutely, every single day. It's been hard. Um, you know, obviously, in the wake of the special session and uh, the passage of same sex marriage, uh, as many people will recall, uh, many of my colleagues and I, you know, we knew that they had the votes. So if you have the votes, why wouldn't you try to make the The bill was defective. It had many, many problems. There are many constitutional issues with that bill. And yet, we introduced Amendment after amendment. Yeah, 28, 28 amendments, yes, and not correct. one of them. And not they one were of them friendly amendments. They were all friendly and, yeah. amendments because knowing that yeah. the bill was going to pass, they had the vote. So why wouldn't we at least try to make this bill better? Uh, unfortunately, my colleagues chose to strike down every friendly floor amendment that was offered. Uh, and so is it discouraging? Absolutely. Um, I think. So why, that, do, why do you stay? Why, why do you serve? I mean, I, 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 I sort of. As voters, we have the lowest voter turnout in the history of Hawaii. We have a very low, low voter turnout in Hawaii mm -hmm. compared to the nation. Yes. Um, why do you care? 
Uh, I believe that this job, honestly, um, when I first ran for office, um, I has ne had never intended to run for office. It was never my, it was never supposed to be in the plan. Uh, essentially what had happened was one day I was in Kapolei, the district in which I represent the second city, and I was outraged at some of the traffic issues we were facing. And as a land use attorney, um, I believed I could speak to the issues of development. We have, again, uh, as Kapolei is known as the second city, we are dealing with growth uh, and development every single day. As you know, rail is starting in our district, yeah. all the homes are being built uh, in Kapolei. And really it started off from a different point of view as my private sector experience as an attorney. And as I started going through it, um, it was a very uh, difficult time for me uh, because as soon as I signed the papers to run for office, three days later I found out my dad had pancreatic cancer. And we went to several specialists and every doctor told my father and my family that my father would die within the next three to six months. And so I told my father that I was not going to run for office and I was going to be with him and spend as much time with him as I could. Uh, my father sat down with me and said, you're going to run for office and I'm going to help you. Uh, the night of the election, and that was one of the things that motivated me because I wanted my father, he was very proud of the fact that he's like, you've made this decision, God has chosen you and you are going to do this and we're going to help you. And I think the proudest moment of my life was the night of the election when I won. My father uh, hugged me tightly and said, I'm going to live forever. My father sat with me on opening day for the first two years of my, uh, my as I was in office. He sat with me on opening day and he lived for two years beyond that. So I was very yeah. proud of that moment. Oh, yes. That is really, really it special. Is. So as you see the battle ahead, mm -hmm. you have a strong message to Christians to be involved, yes. people to get out and vote. Mm -hmm. You still have hope? Absolutely. Again, in God, there's always hope, and I, I will never, I never refuse to, I, I refuse to give up on uh, my Christian brothers and sisters. I think that there is a, a sense of frustration, especially after what they witnessed uh, during the same-sex marriage special session. They felt that their voices were not being heard. And again, I continue to remind people that government works for the people, not the other way around. But if you do not get involved in your government, then you have no right to complain, whether it's being registered to vote, whether it's coming and testifying at the state capitol, whether it's sending in testimony. Um, you know, Pastor Jonathan, during the joint hearing uh, between the, before the Judiciary Committee and the Finance Committee, um, many of our faith-based uh, came to testify in person. And I had my computer and I typed in their names to check if they were registered voters. And I was alarmed at the number of Christians who came to testify who are not in fact registered voters. And again, as I said, my colleagues have a tendency to listen to registered voters who live in their districts. And so until our faith-based brothers and sisters understand that they actually can make a difference, that their voice does count. Um, and I was at First Assembly of God last week speaking before his uh, Pastor Coe's congregation. And some uh, of the individuals had come up saying they were just frustrated with the system and that's mm -hmm. why they didn't want to vote. And while I didn't say this at the time, and I, in retrospect I did regret it, I will say it here, I do believe that's the enemy. Yeah. It's the enemy saying, you know what, be frustrated, so don't get involved, so that I can continue to rule the roost in the state capitol, and our secular ways will continue on, and you will not have a voice. And so, is it frustrating for me as someone who's in the inside? Absolutely, because I know that I'm fighting for our Christian brothers and sisters and our far values, and yet, if I don't have the support and my colleagues and I don't have the support, then who are we doing this for? And so I've reminded people that during the same-sex marriage special session, as arduous and emotional as it was, I could not have gotten through it had it not been for people like yourself, had it not been for many of those who came to the Capitol every day, who prayed for me, who were there for us every single step of the way. They gave us encouragement. They gave us, they prayed over us. They prayed with us. They were with us every step of the way. And we needed that because it was such an arduous process and it was so emotional. I mean, for those of us who stood against mm -hmm. same-sex marriage, we received death threats. Yeah. We were constantly being threatened. And so to have our brothers and sisters there with us meant the world to us and it gave us, it gave us what we needed the ammunition and it gave us the strength that we needed to fight that battle every single day. And so now knowing that we're in the state capitol, we're back in session, session began January the 21st, and to know that we may be in this alone once again, it doesn't bode well for us. It doesn't give us sometimes the faith that we need to have within ourselves and in the, the faith-based community. So I continue to ask our Christian brothers and sisters, if you want us to be your voice, you have to be there for us as well. It's a two-way street. You have to come out and testify. You have to submit testimony. You have to get involved in government. If you are not there, then who are we fighting for? I'm just, I'm thinking of David and Goliath. Yes. You know, and Goliath is in all of his arrogance and confidence just mocking 
and challenging and all of God's people were sitting there quaking. Mm -hmm. And um, we may have some more giants yes. ahead of us. Uh, legalized marijuana, what, what are some of the things that may be on the, the horizon that we need to be praying about, educating ourselves about, and, and verbal about. Yeah, well again, um, as I indicated, uh, tomorrow at the state capitol, um, I think it's just, it's very unfortunate. They've done something which is unheard of. Uh, the For the medical marijuana dispensaries bill, uh, they have fast-tracked the bill. So what they're yeah. doing is, um, it was supposed to be a health, uh, uh, judici a health committee hearing, a separate hearing than a judiciary committee hearing. And instead what they've done is they've combined the two hearings. Mm -hmm. So again, that gives the public one less opportunity to yeah. testify. And that's unfortunate. Again, uh, if people do not get involved in their government, then they reap the consequences. On their time frame. On their time frame, absolutely, <laughs> the, absolutely. Yeah. No, so what's coming after? Okay, so I think, you know, uh, knowing if you listen to some of the opening day speeches and if you looked at the majority package, um, I think, you know, some of the more pressing issues, there was a recent poll done by Ward Research. The four top issues right now in the state of Hawaii are rail, homelessness, traffic, and the economy. And so our typical, you know, in years past, whenever we've done these research polls, it's always been things like education, public safety. So it really shows you the shift yeah. of some of the issues that our residents are concerned with. So that said, um, you know, I think that some of the more pressing social issues are going to take a back burner. Uh, but again, if in fact we legalize marijuana, I would not be surprised in subsequent years whether we start to legalize gambling, yeah. whether physician assisted suicide becomes in another, yeah. you know, comes back to the table. So I think that, um, again, if we don't get involved now, uh, we will only continue to see the further degradation of our society. Do you read your Bible? Absolutely. Why? Every morning when I get up, I pray. I have to pray. Um, it's my time with God, and it's the time that God gives me to uh, inspire me and to replenish me for the day. And oftentimes, I start, I start with my daily devotionals, and I have to read a passage from the Bible in order to get through the day. Um, I oftentimes uh, use my Bible as a source of strength because God reminds me that I'm not in this alone, that He is there, and that He is going to be there for all of us, and that we need to continue to be pray uh, faithfully and with petition. And so these are the types of things that I, I need God, essentially, because He is my rock, and He is what gives me the source of strength. I mean, there are days when I think, I mean, I, I'm not going to lie to you, Pastor Jonathan. I'm a human being. There are days I cry, and I don't want to be in the legislature. And I ask God, why? Why am I here? You know, you, you chose me for this job, but it's so hard, and I'm struggling as a Christian to get through. My faith as a Christian is, is being challenged, and I do feel like because of all the pettiness, and uh, there's a lot of retribution and uh, vindication, mm -hmm. and, and, and everyone chalks it up to it's just politics, mm -hmm. but that doesn't make it right. And so it's very difficult for me. I struggle daily, and that's why I have to to read the Bible to give me that source of inspiration and strength and for God to remind me because he's talking to me and he's simply telling me he's reminding me why he has me here in Goliath he gets struck down yes and um, and the glory goes to God what that means we will see mm -hmm. the days ahead yes Sharon I, I just really appreciate you you're sharing your heart um, sharing some of your passion for the fight that's out there and pray that that will spread out. Would you pray for, we just have a few minutes, would yes. you pray for our voters and that that passion and that hope and that being salt and light in the world would be would be a part of who we are and pray for the Christians that the church would arise. Absolutely. Then we'll close. Thank you. Please. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, I thank you for this moment and for this time to come together and to talk about these very pressing issues that are affecting us here in the state of Hawaii. Heavenly Father, we ha your children are here in our state and they are listening to you and yet they have felt so much frustration in the political realm. Heavenly Father, I ask that you touch our brothers and sisters' hearts. Give them the wisdom and the knowledge that they need and empower them and give them the power that they need to get involved, to understand and to arise up and to understand that this is their government, that they, that government works for the people and that the people do not work for government. However, if the people do not get involved, they will reap the consequences which we are now starting to see. Heavenly Father, I ask that you touch uh, Christian brothers, sisters, and hearts and ask them uh, to ask themselves, why are we 
fighting these battles. We can't do it alone. And for those of us that you've selected to be in the state legislature, I know that you att you're attempting to empower us, Lord, but we know we can't do it without them. So I ask that you touch their hearts, reach out to them, and give them the passion that they need to get involved, to make a difference, and to know that this is their government, and this is a government that needs to represent your values, your culture, and what you stand for. I pray for all these things in your heavenly name. Amen. Amen. We want to encourage those that are watching uh, to get out and get registered. Absolutely. And you know, one last thing, Pastor Jonathan, very quickly. I know that uh, many of our Christian brothers and sisters say that they don't know uh, how to get involved. Please go to hornsofjerichoblog.wordpress.com, and that is one of our Christian brothers who follows the legislature oh. every day, and he explains the bills to people. Okay. And we will continue to pray for you. Thank you. And we want to encourage everyone that is watching to pray for their elected officials yes. around them and to stand up and support them in prayer. And if you have a prayer need, uh, we want to encourage any, any of you that are watching to call our prayer line. And that, that, that there's someone who can pray with you and can encourage you and help you in your walk with the Lord. Right now we're going to have uh, another song by Winners of Hope, Jesus Be the Center of It All. Thank you so much. And join us with you. Center of it all, Jesus. 
Welcome back to Praise the Lord as we've been talking about God and the nation. It's my privilege to have Dr. Pat Zucker in here. Pat is an apologist. He's a national and international speaker. He talks about apologetics and you can explain what that is for most of us and comparative religions. Helps people with understanding the Bible and theology. He has his own radio talk show, Evidence and Answers. I've enjoyed it, Pat. Thank you. Uh, authored several books, uh, graduated from Point Loma Nazarene University, Dallas Theological Seminary, doctorate from Southern Evangelical Seminary. He serves as a, a research associate of Probe Ministries of Hawaii. So, Pat, so glad that, that you're sharing with us and, and thank you for taking this time. Thank you, John. It's great to be here. It's a great privilege to work alongside you as we do many times. Yeah, thanks, Pat. Pat, why is belief in God so critical for the health of any nation or any civilization? Um. Well, first of all, John, there's compelling evidence that God does exist and that truth originates with God. And God wants us to live according to what is truth. And if truth originates with God, if we want the fullness of life and to live life according to all that was designed for us, then we are to live according to God's truth. And if that's true on an individual level, then it's also true on a national level. And one of the things our founding fathers understood that in order for a nation to be free and healthy, we need what's called freedom's triangle. In other words, the first part of the triangle, we need a virtuous or a good moral people who can govern themselves. Now, in order to have a good virtuous people, we need to have a universal moral law that we all abide by. And where does that universal objective moral law comes from? It must come from a moral lawgiver or a God. Now you take away any three parts of those triangle of that triangle and a civilization will collapse and it will return back to tyranny. You need that triangle. So if I'm hearing you correctly, people say, well, what is moral is what the majority thinks or what people say. You would disagree with that. Yes, history shows us there are times when the majority was indeed wrong. Let me give you an example. Let's just say Adolf Hitler and their party became the majority in Germany. Well, were they right? Let's just suppose that Hitler and his army conquered the world and managed to get rid of all those who opposed him. Then would Hitler be right? Well, we would say no, because there is an objective moral law that stands above man and God. And therefore, in order, and, and also, what do you do when cultures come into conflict? You know, we have uh, groups that believe that it's okay to discriminate against a particular race or those who do not agree to their religion, and they're the majority. What about the rights of those who are in the minority? You know, if there is no God, there can be no objective universal moral law. Then it comes down really to a might makes right kind of way of determining can, right from wrong. Can you just outline what are the basic tenets of God's moral law? What, what are we talking about? Sanctity of human life or what, what, what would those tenets be? Yes, you know, first of all, it's very compelling that God does exist and he has revealed himself in two very special ways. One way is through his son, Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. Jesus came, he claimed to be the divine son of God. We have a very accurate historical record of his life in the New Testament. He lived a miraculous, sinless life, died and rose again, confirming his claim to be the divine Son of God. And Jesus, therefore, being the divine Son of God, affirms the Word of God or the Bible. And the Bible is uniquely affirmed as the Word of God. It 
alone has miraculous confirmation that is indeed the Word of God. So God's truth is revealed in His Son, Jesus Christ, and the teachings of Jesus Christ and God's Word, the Bible. That's where truth is revealed. And also, because we're made in the image of God, we also had, have God's moral law within us, or our conscience. And so those are the three guidelines for which we determine truth and right from wrong. But how do you bring that into government? How do you bring that into issues of, of the state? I mean, help us distinguish between this religious freedom and, and discriminating again, because people would say, oh, that, that's exclusive. Well, John, uh, was, we need to be careful when we talk about discrimination and this whole idea of the new tolerance. Just like the human body, the human body tolerates a lot of stuff that you put into it, but there are some things that it will not tolerate, and what is dangerous to the body, the body rejects. Mm -hmm. Now, when we talk about freedom here, it doesn't mean we tolerate all views and belief systems and, and lifestyles as equally valid and true and all deserve to be protected and tolerated. No. Is it right to tolerate groups that have belief systems that uh, discriminate against certain races? Is it right to tolerate groups that have belief systems uh, that would allow you to mutilate uh, parts of a women's anatomy? Is it right to allow a religious system to proliferate and continue that allows uh, the beating and abuse of women? No, those things we should stand against. So a healthy society, like a healthy body, has boundaries or more boundaries of what we will tolerate and what we will not tolerate. All views are not equally valid and true. Some are true and some are false. And we need moral boundaries from which we can determine right from wrong and uh, the ability to challenge ideas that we believe are wrong and damaging to a culture or a society. And you're saying that those boundaries are rooted in revelation of Christ, the Son of God, the revelation of Scripture. Um, for those people that reject that, uh, in Canada this year, uh, one community tried to uh, declare that Sharia law was okay for an education system, um, a whole different moral code. How do you respond to that kind of dynamic? Well, you know, John, the um, Bible does allow for, you know, the freedom of religion. It doesn't uh, call us to persecute those who disagree with us, but it calls upon us to challenge false ideas and okay. to persuade people to our position that is indeed right and true. And laws like Sharia law are very dangerous. Law. Look at the laws it has against women. According to the Quran, those who do not uh, uh, adhere to Islam, what are their choices? You know, according to the Quran, you have three choices. You convert, or you live as a second class citizen paying the high taxes, or you meet the sword. You know, is that the kinds of laws that we, uh, as a free uh, moral people would want to tolerate, or is that the kind of laws that we would stand against? Why is it then that we are tolerating those kinds of laws more and more in our universities or the kind of ideology and the thinking that is going on in our students? Why do you think that shift is happening, or is it? Am I wrong? Well, you know, that's a very deep question that you ask here. It goes all the way back to the Enlightenment, where a philosopher and Kant said, you can't really know reality. If you can't really know reality, Truth is uh, telling the facts like it is, you know. Truth is telling reality like it is. And if you can't know reality, then from there we had a slippery slide goes down to Nietzsche and other philosophers who said, therefore, you can't know truth. There's no such thing as absolute truth or relativism. Then if all truth is relative, how do we determine truth? Well, it just becomes one man's opinion over another. And then it slides into moral relativism. And then you come to the idea that all beliefs are equally valid and true. It's wrong to say one view is true and one view is false. You get this whole uh, idea of the new tolerance. And that's a very dangerous thing. It's a, uh, these kinds of ideologies have dominated our university and now our high school campuses and, and have come to take over our culture. And we see that it has failed in Europe. You know, uh, David Cameron in 2011, when he gave his speech after he was elected, he said the political correctness and multiculturalism and this whole idea of relativism has failed Europe. And now Europe has become the largest breeding ground of radical terrorism. And we see the results of that today. And the Europeans who have bought into all these ideologies are crying out to us from across the Atlantic, warning us, giving us a warning. However, we Americans uh, don't learn and we're following right in their footsteps. 
throw me at an anchor, something solid um, in terms of the Word of God. I mean, you've just given us this great little overview on, on how we get to this point of tolerance and intolerance, which is also there. But where would you have someone go in the scripture to say, this is a, this is a good starting point to keep your, 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 your focus and your head straight when we're looking at these issues within our nation right now? Well, a great place to start, of course, is the book of Romans. It talks about the righteousness of God and what it means to be righteous before God and a righteous nation before God. And also, uh, you could read uh, Romans chapter 1. It talks about the stages of a decline of a nation. Mm. Uh, it talks about the first turning away from God, but then every generation that follows after that. And Romans chapter 1 gives us a clear uh, guideline as to what happens when nations turn away from God. Romans chapter 1 verse 18, it begins with a turning away from God. The evidence of God is evident throughout creation, yet men choose to turn away from God. Then what happens? Well, they embrace false ideas. Paul talks about idolatry. And the false ideas are dangerous and destructive to a nation. And when they embrace false ideas, it leads to the third stage of immorality. And immorality, uh, you talk about sexual immorality, uh, one that is highlighted is the sin of homosexuality. Mm -hmm. And that is devastating to any culture or civilization. And then the final stage is that the civilization collapses. And so God and the belief in God and truth is absolutely essential to the health and welfare of a nation. I mean, history shows us nations and empires are not conquered. They commit their own suicide. Is our nation going to collapse? Well, John, we've got several signs of warning there. I mean, the uh, increase, you know, in immorality. Uh, you know, one of the highlights here that has been talked about is the battle over marriage and the attempted redefining of marriage and the proliferation of gay marriage. It has devastating effects. You know, one of the effects is that uh, we know that history shows us uh, the family of a healthy nation, each family must produce about two and a half children on average to support the aging, retiring nation and the children below it and the economy uh, and the system of that civilization. Now once it drops below that, then it gets very dangerous and you can see what's happening in the countries. For example, the Danes, I mean their birth rate is very low, it's about 1.7. So now they have to import their workers. Same thing in France, they need to import mm -hmm. their workers. Where are they getting their workers from? Well, again, from the Muslim nations of the Middle East and Africa. In fact, in uh, France, one out of every three babies born is an African Muslim. And so the uh, prime ministers in those countries are pleading with their people to marry and have children. They are fighting for their very culture and their identity. So affirming basic Christian family values and what it means in marriage and in having children raising families. What, what other things... Um, do you believe we need to be doing so that we don't implode, we don't collapse from ourselves? What, what, what areas of, of, of hope and what advice do you give to the average person that, that, that's watching this show? Well, you know, as we discussed today, the ultimate problem, I mean, the source of the problem is not political or economic. Mm -hmm. The ultimate source is spiritual, and we need to be able to bring our nation back to a knowledge and fear of God and the truth of God's Word. And in order to do that, the church, once again, needs to be courageously preaching uh, the uncompromising Word of God. Uh, Christians need to take the call of discipleship seriously, what Jesus talked about, to every day take up your cross and follow Him, to lay down your life and to follow after Him with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength. And Christians need to be equipped in what we call apologetics, the defense of the Christian mm -hmm. faith, to engage the ideas of the culture, not to go into retreat, but to engage the ideas of the culture with convincing powerful arguments of the truth of our position and expose the false ideas that are dangerous to the culture. Now your life has, has been set aside to help equip uh, Christians to do that of all ages. Can, can you speak to me about the teenager? Teenager in school. And he's in this school with a completely surrounded by kids with completely different world values, may not even know another Christian. Um, where, where does he start in terms of standing for Jesus and, in, and, and, and being a light and a voice in, in his context? Well, there's probably three things that I could suggest because I was also in that same situation. Number one, um, live the truth. 
You know, if you're living a, a life that is in accords with the scriptures and teachings of Jesus Christ, I mean, you just shine. You're a light in darkness just by the way you live, your attitude, and your conduct. Uh, number two, you need to be able to know the truth and be able to communicate it in a way that people will understand and respond. And third, if you're going to communicate truth of God's word, you're going to take some heat for it. And so third, <laughs> you need to be able to make a defense. So you take heat? Yeah, oh, all the time. And you do as well, I know. To articulate and make a convincing case for why you live the way you do and why you believe the things that you believe. Give some suggestions. We just have a minute here. Some suggestions to a new Christian. Um, how do I learn to communicate that truth well? Well, one of the things, you know, you need to get to know your Bible and study the Word of God. Also, I would encourage them to go to great websites. Uh, my website, evidenceandanswers.org. Uh, we had other guests here, probe.org. Yep. Uh, and study the articles that are out there that shows you how to take these biblical principles and engage the ideas of the world. How do biblical principles apply to medical ethics, to science, to literature, to entertainment? You know, Christianity well, one of the things that plagues us here in the West is we have what's called a schizophrenic Christianity. We think Christianity only applies to my personal walk with God and me going to heaven, but to everything else it doesn't apply. Well, Christianity is a worldview. The principles of Christ apply to every area of the culture, and we need to understand how to take those principles and apply it to the culture around us. Okay, now Pat, I'm going to ask you to pray just as we close off. If you would pray for the people that say, hey, I'm not very good at answering about what I believe. And Lord, help me make an initial step. Help me, help me move forward. Or, or they may know, but they're, they're, they don't have the courage to say that. Would you just pray for those people that are watching in that, in that way? Sure, let's pray. Father, we thank you for the ministry that is here to educate people. We thank you for the men and women who have gone before us to, in defense of your word and the proclamation of your word. We pray for the churches here in Hawaii and throughout the world that proclaim the name of Christ, that they would courageously and in an uncompromising way continue to proclaim and defend your truth. And we pray for every Christian out there that they would come to love you and to love your word and also to love the lost people around them to be burdened so much that they would want to communicate your word to them in a powerful and compelling manner. And would that drive each one of us to equip ourselves in the defense of your faith, that we may communicate and engage the ideas of the culture around us with integrity, with love, and with your truth. And we pray all this in the powerful name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. We have a living God. Yes, we have his word that is living and active and powerful at work and and we have people that God is raising up and uh, thank you so much Pat for encouraging us in terms of getting back into the word and knowing how to give an answer uh, clearly to those that, that ask around and, and to be a light for Jesus in that context and those of you that are watching today we, we hope that you will take those steps in getting into God's word so that you can be used by the Lord as a light and as a powerful influence in your community, in your school, in your workplace, in the marketplace, and that you will be part of the transformation of our nation, that God will bless us and that God will move powerfully as we lift his name up for all to see. My name's Jonathan Steeper. It's been a real privilege together with you, and, and we want to encourage you, if you have any questions, if you have any comments or concerns, that you can write to TBN, P.O. Box A, Santa Ana, California, 92711. You can go to the website www.tbn.org. Thank you so much. Praying that you will praise the Lord with joy, for the victory belongs to our Lord Jesus. We're so glad you've been with us for Praise the Lord. TBN has a worldwide ministry. We need your love gifts, large or small, to help keep the gospel of Jesus Christ going around the world. So write today, Praise the Lord, P.O. Box A, Santa Ana, California, 92711. Or in Canada, write TBN, P.O. Box 768, Station B, Ottawa, Ontario, K1B, 5B8. If you haven't asked Christ into your life, call our prayer partner now and pray to receive Jesus as Savior and Lord. Now until next time, remember to praise the Lord.
This program has been brought to you through the prayers and contributions of our faithful partners throughout North America and the world.